Okay, we'll start with an opening prayer. Thank you, Lord, for these few minutes to study these ideas and words, and may they help us increase our joy and fulfillment in our lives, and may that spill over and help those in our hearts and minds all harm-free. In the name of Jesus, amen. We will continue with reading Seth Speaks, chapter 8. We are starting session 534, and it goes with, uh, starts like this. I hope I do not shatter your peace, and we will resume dictation. Consciousness has many characteristics, some, of course, known to you. Many of the characteristics of consciousness, however, are not so apparent, since presently you largely use your own consciousness in such a way that its perceptions appear in quite other than natural, and that's in quotes, guises. You are aware of your own consciousness, in other words, through the medium of your own physical mechanism. You are not nearly as aware of your own consciousness when it is not operating primarily through the mediumship of the body, as it does in out-of-body states and some disassociated conditions. The characteristics of consciousness are the same whether you are in a body or outside of one. The peaks and valleys of consciousness that I mentioned exist to some degree in all consciousness despite the form adopted after death. The nature of your consciousness is no different basically than it is now, though you may not be aware of many of its characteristics. Now, your consciousness is telepathic and clairvoyant, for example, even though you may not realize it. In sleep, when you often presume yourself to be unconscious, you may be far more conscious than you are now, but simply using abilities of consciousness that you do not accept as real or valid in waking life. You therefore shut them out of your conscious experience. Consciousness, yours and mine, is quite independent of both time and space. And after death, you are simply aware of the greater powers of consciousness that exist within you all the time. Since they do, of course, you can discover them now and learn to use them. This will directly assist you in after-death experience. You will not be nearly so startled by the nature of your own reactions if you understand beforehand, for example, that your consciousness not only is not imprisoned by your physical body, but can create other portions at will. Those who over-identify their consciousness with their body can suffer self-created torment for no reason, lingering about the body. Indeed, quite the forlorn soul thinking it has no other place to go. You are, as I said earlier, a spirit now. And that spirit has a consciousness. The consciousness belongs to the spirit then, but the two are not the same. The spirit may turn its consciousness off and on. By its nature, consciousness may flicker and fluctuate, but the spirit does not. I do not particularly like the word spirit because of several implications attached to it, but it suits our purposes in that 
the word does imply an independence from physical form. Consciousness does not refresh itself in sleep. It is merely turned in another direction. Consciousness does not sleep, then, in those terms. And while it may be turned off, it is not like a light. Turning it off does not extinguish it in the way that a light disappears when a switch is turned. Following the analogy, if consciousness were like a light that belonged to you, even when you switched it off, there would be sort of a twilight, but not darkness. The spirit, therefore, is never in a state of nothingness with its consciousness extinguished. It is very important, therefore, that such be realized. For there, it is very important to understand that consciousness is never extinguished. You have been acting out the material this evening, Joseph. Seth, uh, at this point, suspended dictation on his book. And this is due to the fact that Joseph, whose real name is Robert Butt, who transcribes Seth as he speaks, began to have more and more problems with writing the words down correctly until the point where he asked him to stop. After a period of time, back at 1047, they resumed. Now, in the demonstration in which Joseph so kindly assisted us, several points were made to implement the material just given. Earlier, I said that you are only familiar with those characteristics of your own consciousness that you use through the mediumship of the body. You rely upon the body to express the perceptions of your consciousness. You tend, again, to identify the expression of your consciousness with the body. In our demonstration, to which, of course, Joseph gave his permission, he allowed his consciousness to retreat and to some degree began to cut off its physical expression. He was not aware consciously of his permission simply because this kind of demonstration could not be held if the normal waking consciousness knew. It would automatically be frightened. As I spoke about the dimming of consciousness, Joseph then experienced. You know, give us a moment. This was an exercise actually in the manipulation of consciousness. Close to death, the same sort of thing happens in varying degrees. When the consciousness realizes that it can no longer express itself through the mediumship of the body. If the dying person over-identifies with the body, then he can easily panic, thinking that all expression is therefore cut off, and for that matter, that his consciousness is about to be extinguished. Such a belief in extinction, such a certainty that identity is about to be blotted out in the next moment, is a severe psychological experience that in itself can bring about unfortunate reactions. What happens instead is that you find consciousness quite intact and its expression far less limited than it was before. Joseph chose subconsciously to interrupt those methods of expression he was using at the time simply so that their interference would claim due notice. We will be dealing now, after what I hope is suitable background material, with some chapters on the nature of existence after physical death, at the point of death, and involving the final physical death at the end of the reincarnational cycle. It was important that you understand something about the nature and behavior of your own consciousness before we could begin. And it says you may take a break and then 
he resumes slowly. He says, you also drew upon some knowledge, Joseph, from past experience in our demonstration. When in your final illness, motor function was impaired. This was in Denmark. The last note is an aside rather than strict dictation. Now, I am ending this chapter, and with it, I'm ending part one of my book. Give us a moment. And end of dictation. And then he goes on and explains a little bit more about what happened. So that's it. That's the end of chapter eight, the end of session 534, the end of part one of Seth Speaks. So what we want to use as a statement to summarize this information is basically that we clearly understand that consciousness is used by our spirit, that spirit never is extinguished, and consciousness is not extinguished. Sometimes it'll be turned off, but not completely. So therefore, let's just make it one farther step removed in order to stretch our beliefs and say, uh, my spirit uses consciousness to perceive realities with an S. My spirit uses consciousness to perceive realities, and that's with an S, so that we know that there is more than one that we exist in. And today's date is September 10th, 2014. My spirit uses consciousness to perceive reality. And we'll have a closing prayer. Thank you. Lord, for this time to study these ideas, to expand our mind with this belief. We do not need to fear death, knowing that we continue on after our body dies. And may this help us, not only later on, but now, as we begin to explore our skills and abilities of our own consciousness. May all this occur harm-free leading to a more fulfilling life for ourselves and those in our hearts and minds. Mm -hmm.